it feels like you can get your credit scores anywhere these days. Random websites, card statements, budgeting apps, heck, even your dog might bark out a few numbers. It's true, Credit Karma isn't the only place you can find them, but we actually do more with your scores to help you find your next financial opportunity, like a more rewarding credit card, a game plan that helps you pay down debt faster, or a personal loan to help you save more on interest payments each month. Cha-ching! The possibilities are kinda endless. Download Intuit Credit Karma today to get started. With Uber Reserve, you can book your Uber ride in advance, 90 days in advance. Perfect for all you forward thinkers and planning gurus. Reserve your Uber ride up to 90 days in advance. Uber Reserve. See Uber app for details. As a parent, one of your primary wishes is to keep your child well and healthy. It's inbuilt in us as parents to try and achieve this and to protect our little ones. So this week, I am joined by a vaccination guru and registered nurse Lisa Broom. There, there is that seasonal cold and flu that children get um, and for that we have a vaccine that supports the immune system of children. Yes. We don't want to have created a stress and a fear around that environment yeah. so I think that yes. having that trust so that your child trusts yeah. what you are saying is going to happen to them and explaining to them. We recommend that the babies have a dose of paracetamol every four to six hours for the ne- at least the next 24 to 48 hours after having that vaccine. Hello, I'm Pip and welcome to the Midwife Pip podcast, the home of expert information and real chats on all things pregnancy, birth and beyond. Now, as a parent, one of your primary wishes is to keep your child well and healthy. It's inbuilt in us as parents to try and achieve this and to protect our little ones. Which is perhaps why 57% of parents surveyed by one poll for the Department of Health and Social Care said having a sick child is the most stressful aspect of family life, significantly higher than stresses like welcoming a new baby into the family. The poll also found that nearly half of parents surveyed reported having to miss work due to their child being ill. For many, this disruption is a frequent occurrence. Over one in five parents said their child is unwell once every few months, and 12% experience their child being ill multiple times in a single month. Most common coughs or colds, like I'm sporting today, can be mild and difficult to avoid. But more serious infections that cause serious illnesses, hospitalisation and even lifelong disabilities are rising too. And it's a good time to be thinking about how we protect babies and young children from these diseases with vaccination. Health officials from the UK Health Security Agency are urging parents to check their children's vaccinations are up to date. Amid fears of a back-to-school surge of diseases like measles and whooping cough due to falling vaccination uptake rates. To give your child the best protection from these illnesses, it's important that their vaccines are up to date. Vaccines prevent over 5,000 deaths and over 100,000 hospital admissions each year in England alone. If your child isn't vaccinated, then they're not protected. But there's a lot of misinformation and a lack of knowledge for parents around vaccinations. So this week, I am joined by a vaccination guru and registered nurse, Lisa Broom. Lisa has joined us to answer some of the common questions and concerns parents have around vaccinations and the advice and tips she gives to help them navigate child immunizations and sometimes the fear of the great unknown for some parents. So welcome Lisa and thank you very much for joining us today because like we were saying before I hit record it feels very seasonal and I'm even come sporting a cold um, for this topic as well. Yes thank you thanks Pip for having me on. Yes um, it's there. there is that seasonal 
cold and flu that children get. Um, and for that, we have a vaccine that supports the immune system of children. And of course, that has the wider effect of supporting those who may be vulnerable and at high risk of um, contracting any illness in addition to the, to the usual um, flu that's, that, goes, that comes around at this time of year. I know winter's here, isn't it? Like it's yeah. cold now. Kids are back at school and childcare, and there is so much yes, going around. Yes. And oh my goodness, with a toddler and a baby, we definitely feel that in our household. Yes. Lisa, I feel like there are so many vaccinations and immunizations, and it's one of those things where there's constantly new ones coming out and new ones being mm. kind of suggested. Yes. Could you break it down for parents listening? around what vaccinations a baby and a young child should actually receive in their lifetime? What ones do we need to be kind of, I guess, mentally ticking off in our brain? Okay, so the first lot, lot of vaccines are what, what we usually refer to as the primary course of vaccines. And they are given at eight weeks, 12 weeks and 16 weeks. The, they, they require... The first two require an oral administration. And for that, we, we usually recommend that moms give the, the, the themselves and the child a little bit of time without food, without oral intake, just to ensure that they accept the vaccine, the oral vaccine, because as we know, these young young sprouts are very finicky about what goes into their mouths. And if they don't like it, they just tend to spit it out. Um, it's, it's a natural reflex of theirs, which is very good. It's, we, we know it has to do with their natural instinct of survival, that things that may be bitter or not like they get rid of. Um, and so we ask moms that they hold off on a feed so that they're just that little bit hungry so for them to be able to swallow the, the first lot of vaccines known as the Rotorix vaccine. In addition to that, the combination of, the, of that first lot of vaccines, um, it there is a tendency for children to develop a bit of a temperature within six hours after getting that combination. So instead of giving the mom that extra stress of dealing with the anxiety of having them vaccinated and, um, and a possible temperature, we recommend that the babies have a dose of paracetamol every four to six hours for the ne at least the next 24 to 48 hours after having that vaccine. They may need to carry on for a day or two after, but what we would like is that if the baby does develop a temperature that they look out to see that the, the action that they take reduces a temperature. So that's, that's, conservative action that you would take for a baby or anybody who has a temperature that you have um, extra fluid, that the room is well ventilated, that the, the clothes are nice and airy, um, and that paracetamol is given. If you've taken all of that action and you don't find that the temperature in the baby starts reducing, say in about say 20 to half, a, half an hour, 20 minutes to half an hour after administration, um, it's, it's reason to become a, a little bit concerned. So you're looking at no reduction in temperature and that your baby isn't the, the beautiful person that he or she is, that they're not bright and looking around, that they're a bit floppy or they're a bit peevish and you cannot settle them. So if you're seeing these this tendency or these tendencies in addition to no change in the temperature, we, we, we would advise that you, you urgently seek help. You seek ad advice, you call your GP, you call your nurse. Um, outside of, of working hours, we would suggest that you call 111. And if you and if and if you know things you are you're you're really anxious and things get out of hand, 
feel free go to the hospital and and seek help we would never send you away saying we would never touch and say oh first time mom look at them you know listen this th these children are the future of of our country of the world yes so we are going to we, we, we give them the utmost priority in 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 care so um yeah so th that that's one of one of the first things that we would recommend and of course for moms it, you you don't have to looking at you pip you don't have to have a lot of fancy equipment to identify that the child isn't well or that the temperature is above that baby is on you yes you're holding that baby both mom and dad, and you know that temperature, that that maternal instinct would have kicked in, and you know this he or she isn't feeling right to me. You know, um, I'm, I, you're looking in that face, and they look in yours all the time. You know, as though the world lives in mommy's face, <laughs> and you can see any changes in the in the way the eyes, in the way your baby's eyes look, the color. You know. In addition, if you have the equipment, all well and good, but also go with that maternal instinct. Yes, you're 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 lucky to have it. Use it. Yes, and and care for your baby. Definitely, it's the most powerful piece of equipment we've got. I think, isn't it? That yeah, maternal, yeah. All that maternal instinct, and it's something we we definitely talk about quite a lot on the podcast. Is you know you're in tune with your baby. Yeah. So Lisa, we have those those eight week, those twelve week, those sixteen week immunizations. Mm -hmm. What comes next? What else have we got to look forward to? <laughs> then you have the dreaded one year old vaccine. <laughs> the set of vaccines. Um, it it seems that it's a it's a four course. Yes, you have four different vaccines at one year old. I shouldn't say different because some of them are repeats and just boosters, while two in particular are very new. And um, the one of as one of the the natural instincts is that you're thinking, oh my gosh, four for my baby, but rest assured that your baby has the capacity to deal with it. Yes. The, your baby is new, yeah, perfect and new with all of the immune, all of the immune ability to deal with these vaccines. So go for it. Give them the, the protection that they need, not only because of their ability to deal with it, but because vaccines are very specific. It's not the, the science behind it is very specific. And as you know, we continue doing research all the time. It's an ongoing, ongoing business. Um, so the baby has the capacity, in addition to which the protection that you would have given the, the baby mom tends to wane at, at that point. So some of the things started, they start losing that that perfect set of immunity that you would have given them. And in particular, the, the measles, mumps and rubella protection that you would have given and you would have been tested for during your um, your pregnancy, just before your, uh, your pregnancy or at the start of it. As it starts to come down, we need to give the baby the protection for the measles, mumps and rubella as they go out into the world. Yeah, because the whole thing is about you are you you've given them the certain protection so far. So at at eight weeks, certain certain immunity starts coming down, and then it's the another sort starts set of immunity starts coming down again at one year old. And we are giving them that ability to go out into the world and experience it to its full. We're giving them that protection that they can touch, they can feel, they can taste without fear. Yes. So, yes. So the next lot is at one year old. And we advise, again, that you um, you hold off on on a bit of, of the oral intake because this is when the baby will have the final of the... Um, the meningitis B vaccine, the one that you need to give them the 
paracetamol for. So let's ensure, let's do what's, what, what will give us the best outcome. Let's hold back on, a, on the feed a bit so that they're a bit hungry and they take the paracetamol so that they, they cruise through that uh, the meningitis B vaccine. The, it's called Bexero. <laughs> My brand new book. Midwife Pip's Guide to a Positive Birth is now available. So much more than a book, this is a guide that allows me to hold your hand through your birth preparation journey. With over a decade of experience and knowledge packed in to ensure you really are empowered in the way you deserve to achieve a positive birth, regardless of the twists and turns that crop up. Make sure that you get your hands on Midwife Pip's Guide to a Positive Birth Book now and are empowered to have the birth experience that you deserve. And it's, it's such a difficult one, isn't it? Because naturally, as a parent, if you could not, uh, you know, inflict an injection on your child, oh, of course, you know, we don't yes. want to do that. And mm. I think it's sometimes it's really hard, isn't it, to take that step back and realise the greater the greater yes. good and I've discussed on the on the podcast um, when Alfie was five weeks Lisa he had meningitis um, and having gone through that experience you know our first son oh, yeah. was fully vaccinated mm -hmm. but it highlighted to me really close to home yeah. actually the importance of trying to prevent these illnesses in our children that ultimately are are life-threatening, aren't they? And have so yes. many long-term consequences yes. in comparison to the short-term, you know, pain, inconvenience, discomfort, that really lots of cuddles as they get older, great bribery. Our <laughs> three-year-old just had his nasal flu vaccine, but he okay. was born in COVID. So okay. he's very much associated masks with doctors mm -hmm. and his immunizations yes, um, yes and there was a lady in the waiting room that happened to have a mask on which completely threw oh, him my i'm gosh. off to see the doctor and i'm gonna get a sticker and play with the trains to yes. oh my goodness there's a mask mm -hmm. but there was lots of bribery he had his favorite biscuits afterwards and the nurse gave us the stickers and all was good yes. so actually that short term compared to the long-term impact yes is a no-brainer isn't it and it's exactly. you know, these are these vaccines are not going to be given to children lightly. It's only really if there's that risk benefit in favour, which is why healthcare professionals, you know, governing bodies really strongly recommend that parents do yes. accept yes, vaccinations. Yes. And I think one of the things I often say to parents, Lisa, if they are unsure about having their child vaccinated or they've got questions that they just need reassurance on is to go along to the appointment even if you don't commit to having the vaccine then and there, but mm. have that discussion with a healthcare pr practitioner so that yes. you can ask those questions. Mm. Don't think because you haven't got the full information, you'll just avoid the vaccine program. Actually empower yourself, empower your child, go and ask questions, have that appointment, even if you don't commit to it on that day, but yes. you get more information to allow you to make an informed decision for your baby or child. Yeah, you're so right. You're so right, Pip. And I'm, I, I must say, I'm sorry that you had that experience of your baby being severely ill. Um, we feel for our babies with, with a cold and, and that when, when we hear a stuffy nose, mm -hmm. um, far more for when, when they have something a bit more severe. Um, uh, good on you for, for getting through that successfully. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I definitely felt a sense of relief once we got through the vaccination yes. program, actually. So as much as I yeah. think I probably found it harder the first time with my first son, whereas this time yes. I was like, good, the more of these we have, you know, the less chance yeah. of you ever being in that position again. I kind of, I, fe I found it easier, I think, the vaccine yeah. side, because I knew what we were preventing. Yes. And I think if parents are sort of, you know, apprehensive purely on the short term pain and discomfort level, actually just remember what you're preventing for your child, yes. um, which is so, so, so important. Yes, yes, you're so right. Yeah, so they 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 do struggle, and we well, we all struggle a little bit with, you know, the the discomfort that they have when they have the vaccines. I tend to I find that at that point that you mentioned when they're three years, four months, and they're coming in, and they 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 have knowledge, they have they they, they know. You know, yeah. as a matter of fact, they, they know even before that, but 
by the time they're three or four, where where they're verbally telling us things. They're very aware, aren't they? Yes, it's 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 very it's it's more of a challenge. Um, so I I I have a, a whole routine that I go through. I'm sure a lot of my moms, when they hear it, they they would laugh. Um, but I I go through the the performance of. of talking to them about, you know, going to big school, you know, you're getting ready and you love to play and we want you to play a lot. Um, and, but when you play, you know, sometimes you fall and, or you, you, something happens and you get a bit of an ouchie and this, what, what you're going to have now, it's a little ouchie. It won't last too long, but it will protect you from more ouchies and you won't miss anything at school. You won't miss all those fun times at school. And they're, they're able to relate to that. So, so that works sometimes, but then I, I encourage moms, you know, have, have a chat with them, but have a chat with them at their level, you know, and so that they understand a little bit about what what is going to happen because nothing is more is more traumatic when they see you or they see someone and it triggers that fear it makes it all so much more difficult yeah, for for them to accept the the vaccine um we we, we advise other things like um ensuring that they have clothes that's e that the the nurse or whoever is administering it's it's the the getting to the arms the upper arms of the child is easy so that there's easy access um for for vaccinating um and then of course as as you said you you know you have to sometimes you have to do a bit of negotiation and and explain to them that um there's a treat there's a, a treat after and you know them moms and dads you know what they like or what this type of really really distracts them so use it use listen use everything at your disposal I love a bit of hardcore bribery sometimes but it's <laughs> to nice get doesn't it? it yeah to get the truth and and you know something when it's it's fun or you there's something that's that was fun it makes it less memorable as something that was traumatic yeah I remember that with my daughter my daughter just remembers that the nurse had a jar of sweets and there were teddy bears on on the desk and Brilliant. she says I cannot remember the ouchie I remember the teddy bears <laughs> That's yeah so interesting, and isn't she gave it? and she gave me a sweet after and that was it you know um so with ours we we try all we try balloons um, and of course there are the stickers we're no longer able to give sweets anymore but listen stickers work a charm <laughs> so um use that or anything else that you know mom and dad favorite favorite um meal yeah or favorite activity after we we if there's a, a park promise them uh some time in the park you know promise them that cookie or or sandwich or whatever it is they like um we we recommend as a practitioner i would encourage moms or dads to be able to hold their their loved ones firmly so that there's the the arms and the legs because the the natural instinct is that if there's an out to you your your hand moves to that area to grab and we are moving around them with something very sharp in our hands so we would advise that you you take some control so that they are not grabbing an area or they are not twisting and moving while something sharp is going into them because that will just that will just make it more of an ouchie you know and the less the less discomfort we can cause the better we have better compliance what we've seen is that there's better compliance with individuals if they've had less traumatic experiences so you know let, let's go for it we, we can only try
Yeah. And I guess it, it comes down, I think, with those older children to that trust element, doesn't it? Actually, yes. fair care provider, you know, yeah. as as a mum taking, you know, a three-year-old or a one-year-old into their immunizations, there's no point in pretending it's not going to happen because then they're yeah. just not going to trust you. And the, exactly. the last thing we want is to create an environment where our children do fear seeing a doctor. Because mm. if they do then need to see a doctor, which inevitably they will do about something completely unrelated to needles, it yeah. may just be they're examining their you know, their skin or, yeah. or their chest or something yeah. like that that isn't invasive. Yes. We don't want to have created a stress and a fear around that environment. Yeah. So I think that yes. having that trust so that your child trusts yeah. what you are saying is going to happen to them and explaining to them and almost trying, I suppose, to allow them to give some element of acceptance or yes. kind of consent yes. in a, you know, in a loose exactly. way, obviously, at their yeah. age. Yeah. But um, but letting them be part of that process and like you say, explaining they understand so much more than we mm. than we mm. realize. Yeah. Lisa, one of the things I really wanted to ask you was, we know and and I kind of discussed that a little bit in the introduction to our episode that there has been a reduction in the uptake of vaccinations for young mm -hmm. children and babies in the recent years. Mm -hmm. And as a healthcare practitioner, as someone that specialises in this area of healthcare. Why is that such a primary concern for you and those that you work with? And therefore, why should we be worried about it too, right? Yes, uh, yes, Pip. We've we've had um, a reduction, overall reduction in the uptake of vaccinations. So what has happened is that the, those little bugs, I, I call them to make it, to simplify it, um, they have been able to flourish a little bit more than than they would usually do because we vaccinate in with a, with an aim of cause of of causing herd immunity, and if the the when when we don't vaccinate, those bugs are get they get more hosts in a community to to flourish and grow. We don't see we don't see a lot of the the the, the ill health. We we do, not the ill health. We don't see a lot of the of of the infections around. You know, we we, we don't see the bugs. They're, they're they're too small. They're too minute. You, you when when someone sneezes, you you, you don't see how far uh, the the that that spray of 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 um of mucus and everything goes around. I'm trying, trying to think of a polite way, way. So that, but but it's there. Yes, we know if you 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 travel on a, a, a train, a plane, and there are ill people that you, if you don't, if you're not vaccinated, you, you, get, you get the illness. They are out there. They are out there, even though we're not seeing it. So that when fewer people take up the vaccines, then there are more hosts for for these the, these bugs to to grow and live in, um, and so that they they we're we're, cre we're creating a pool for for the spread of of uh, an infection when we don't vaccinate. When you vaccinate, the, what, what, what you're doing is that you're not creating that pool and there's nowhere for, for, for the bugs to grow. There's nowhere for it to flourish so that we can get back to that point like we did with the polio where it just died out. We can get back to that point like where smallpox, where it's not there at all. You know, This is what we would like with every illness. Yeah. Um, and this is why we have to vaccinate. We need we need to get rid of the pools. Definitely. And we're seeing, aren't we, like, you know, these, like you say, these illnesses coming back that were historic illnesses. And we need to yes. we need to prevent that because it's our children, ultimately, that are going to be the people that are going to be the people suffering. Yes. Now, I know, Lisa, when we talk about parents making a form choice around all aspects of their health care, including that of immunizations and vaccinations, we talk about risks and benefits and I think we've gone through the benefits you know massively in terms of protecting our children are there any risks associated with vaccines Lisa that parents need to know about so um there there, there are no confirmed risks with them we know that they cause short-term 
discomfort, short-term illnesses. Uh, so you may find that uh, your your child may have a, a fever. The, the the limbs where they get it may be where they get the injections may be a little sore, but the, we have no confirmed reports of the vaccines causing an infection. We may have some children that with every every vaccine they tend to be um, they tend to be a little under the weather. Yes, so they may lose their appetite, they they may be a bit grumpy, but it's short term. It's not a long term illness that they would experience. The long term we we find too that if you have um, say children who have underlying conditions and are more susceptible to have to being very ill if they were to get infected, they too sometimes tend to struggle a bit with building the immunity. Yes, yeah? so they may be a little unwell for a little while longer, but believe me, they don't get the nasties. Uh, which which can ha which which have long term life altering effects. Yeah, it comes back to that greater picture, doesn't it? I think mm -hmm. and zooming out and actually what you want for your child. Mm -hmm. Um, and often you know that risk benefit really does sway quite strongly. In this case, it's not always the way, but I think with vaccinations, it swings really quite strongly in favour of having them done. Yeah. Um, Lisa, could you? Everyone that comes on the podcast, I ask for three yeah. top tips. So I wonder if you you know, with your professional hat on, could share with, uh, with us three top tips that you would give to parents that are in that in that remit of vaccination for their child? Uh, yes, uh, it, it's, it's a lot of what I've already mentioned, you know, for the first lot of vaccines or for any vaccines where, the, where say paracetamol has to be given and for the first and second where the one of the vaccines is oral i i recommend that you you hold off a bit on any oral intake just before vaccination so that the vaccines and the the um protect the prophylactic uh, treatment is accepted um the other thing is the other thing that i would recommend is that um, you you can prepare yourself for soothing the baby. So if you're if you you're breastfeeding, I would suggest that you wear something that you can breastfeed and soothe your baby immediately after. Or if if possible, probably have a bottle a bottle so that they can they can have a feed and 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 be comfortable after. Um, and the, the other thing that I would, would, would strongly recommend is to be aware of positioning. You hold your, your baby in a position that the practitioner can get to either the anterior lateral thigh or to the arm and to, to secure the baby firmly so that they are not moving when a sharp object is coming close to them. I hope that Definitely. answers your question. Yeah, I think it just comes down to making it easier for everyone, doesn't it? Yeah. And the easier it is for you and the practitioner, the easier yeah. it is for your baby. Yeah. And I always say to mums, like, especially that 24 hours post-vaccine, have nothing in the diary. Okay. Like, yeah, yeah. have all your favourite treats because you're probably going to feel you're you right. know, yeah. fairly tired and, yeah. you know, emotional. So have all your favourite treats yeah. and just be really kind to you and your baby. Have all the skin to skin that you want to need to kind I of navigate you, it. You're so um, right. And I, I also, Lisa, I don't know if this is something you talk to parents about, but I often say if you can, try and get a morning vaccination appointment so that yeah. first temperatures in daylight hours because yes. everything's just easier in the day isn't it yes. especially if it's your yes. first baby or you're really anxious about then having a temperature if mm. that happens at 2 p.m it's just easier than if it happens at yes. 2 a.m for the first yes. time i think yeah yeah you're, you're right because even with us as adults you, you know if we were if we have the cold you know that by evening time we all we tend to feel it's worse you know, we, we find that we I can't breathe. 
you know, you find that you're stuffy, that a fever will, if it didn't come on all day, it comes on by the evening. It's, it's, um, I won't go into the, the, the details of that, but it's a natural process of our body and our, how our immune system works. So you're right. If you can have it earlier in the day, it's, it's much more comfortable, not only for baby, but for yourself. Um, and yes, you have, you need to prepare yourself to i i do the 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 most minor in that i i have i know especially for first time moms that you would have you'll be tearful yes and it's it's healthy i said go i say go ahead cry get it out yeah because you have you i in, in terms of midwifery, as a mom, you have all those hormones that we want you to to unleash. Yes. So I say, you know, get it out, get it out, out there so that you are able to cope better with this traumatic event for you and baby. So what, what I have is my little box of tissues, because believe me, it's not only the moms. It's the, sometimes you have dads <laughs> cry also. Uh -huh. It's a sad Oh, you. <laughs> talking of tears out of it oh, yeah amazing oh lisa thank you so much it's been oh, it's so good. helpful to talk about such an important topic so thank you so much for your time oh thank you thank you so much for having me pip before i head off i need to tell you something 68 percent of you who listen to my show have not hit the subscribe button so can you do me a favor and if you've ever enjoyed listening, hit subscribe now. It makes a huge difference, helping me to keep bringing you episodes. And together, we can then reach and empower more women on this journey. If you are a pregnant or newly postpartum listener and are looking to have the healthiest, most positive and informed journey, then my exclusive Your Pregnancy and Your Postnatal Journey courses may be for you. I work with a select number of women in a bespoke way with unlimited access to me and my expert team for the most transformative level of support at this important time in your life. We only get one shot at getting this time right. So to get in touch and find out more, head to midwifepip.com. Hi, I'm Sam Baker and welcome to The Shift, the podcast that aims to tell the no-holds-barred truth about being a woman post-40. Anyone that's worried about turning 40, I say, hurry up and get here. This is where the party is. This is the good place. Created and hosted by me, journalist and author Sam Baker. I started The Shift because I was so tired of the absence of older women's voices. Three little injections around my eyes and suddenly I was like, oh, I just got the last year back. I'm not trying to look 30. I just want to look 42. Where had all the women over 40 gone? You know, nobody ever gets addicted to kale. You get addicted <laughs> to things that kill you. So I created The Shift to make a space to talk about everything from life, love, sex, to careers, confidence, mental health, menopause. So, I mean, seriously, if you want to walk about in your pyjamas for the rest of your life, we're invisible. Each episode, I speak to an inspiring woman about her shift, the second half of our lives. I feel very strong and think I genuinely don't care what anybody thinks of me, and that does come with age. Join me every Tuesday, wherever you listen to your podcasts.